it's Josh with the Financial Advisor Car Guy. This week I wanted to spend a little time talking to you guys about some entry-level supercars. When I mention entry-level, I'm talking used and I'm talking south of $100,000. In fact, maybe even closer to $50,000. So you might be wondering what those are. Um, I'll just dive right in. You know, realistically, one of these cars is a car that I've kind of lusted after ever since it was announced in late 2007. Um, it may have even been announced a little earlier than that, but I remember 2007, and 2008 is actually when the car came to market. This car is called an Audi R8, and when it first came out, it was pretty sporty looking. At the time, I actually drove an Audi A4, and so I was everything Audi. That was kind of my jam, and um, really, really liked the look and the sound and the feel of that R8. And it was everything that, you know, my sedan wasn't. Um, my car was great, I loved it. It was very comfortable, lots of power, had just about every option. I mean, heated seats, heated, heated everything, um, power everything, you know, it was really, really a nice, smooth ride. But turning, turning that into a, a more two-seat, two-door, compact sports car, um, was super, super appealing to me. And, um, you know, by 2008, when, when this car came out, I was having my first kid. So I, I wasn't really thinking about cars that didn't have back seats at that moment in time. And so, you know, it was always kind of a pipe dream for me. And fast forward, you know, 13 years, the car's been around a while. Um, the 2001s are here and they look a little different than they did back in 2008 but not a ton. I mean, they've kept the, the original lines for the most part. Um, the styling is very similar. The interior has been upgraded, but, but still holds that same, you know, feel as it did 13 years ago. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read from my iPad here a few stats about the Audi R8, and then we're going to transition into uh, something that I consider its competitor, but we'll talk a little bit about that too. Um, but the first generation, yeah, it came to the U.S. in 08, and it stuck around until 2015. It was basically a car that MSRP at about 109, 110,000, and then it could be specced way up. Um, certain color, certain interior, certain just options all around. Um, you could have fancier lighting, you could have, in fact, I don't think you could get it without navigation or without heated seats. It came pretty well loaded anyway. But customizing, you know, as you can see, it's got this carbon fiber door blade, or what they call it, their door blade, um, behind the driver and passenger door. That thing is pure carbon fiber. And it came in different colors. You could get it in black, um, or you could get it in the white or silver carbon, depending on what you want to call it. But, you know, conceptually, it was a very um, beautiful addition to the car. It made it unlike a lot of its other competitors. Um, Audi's real basic sports car, the TT, has a little bit of similarity from, from afar. Um, you know, it's maybe a little squattier and a little shorter and a little skinnier. And, you know, the R8's got muscular hips and it's, you know, low and long and wide and, you know, all these beautiful things that a sports car ought to be. Um, but that differentiator, that side blade, really makes this thing stand out. If we talk about production numbers, uh, it was a fairly low produced car for the masses. Um, they gauged it pretty well. Um, in fact, worldwide production never exceeded 5,700 units in a year. Um, that was 2008, that was the very first year. They produced more that year than any, any other year. And, um, you know, not even all of them made it to the States, obviously. In fact, in 2008, only 900 of the 5,600 made it over to the U.S. Uh, the U.S. largest sales figures um, are, are actually quite crazy to me. Uh, in 2008, 900 cars sold in the U.S. In 2009, 699 cars sold in the U.S. So to me, that's pretty mind-blowing because they're relatively easy to find. They're, they're used, you, you can find them anywhere. Um, I browse Car Gurus, Auto Tempest, Craigslist, Facebook Marketplace, um, you know, what else? Auto Trader, a lot of those, Carfax website, you know, and there's a ton of Audi R8s on there for sale at any moment. Um, so it just blows my mind that the production numbers are so low because really, if you're driving around in a 2012, you're one of 800 across the 50 states. 
So there, there's not a ton of them out there. So there's some exclusivity. Um, prices have fallen a bunch. You know, in 2008, when this thing MSRP did 109, 110,000, um, it came with a V8, 4.2 liter V8. And, you know, again, there's not, there's not a ton of them out there. And they depreciated pretty heavily the first three, four, five years, fell to, you know, maybe the low 70s, high 60s, and have really leveled out. Um, buying one today, if you were to go look, there's only two or three in all the US, literally all the US that are under $60,000. And two of those three, I believe, at least from my research, have branded titles. So, you know, we'll call $60,000 the baseline. Um, it's fallen almost in half. If, if you bought one in 2008 and spec'd it nice with an upgraded interior, you wanted you know, all the bells and whistles, everything upgraded, lighting, GPS, all, all those things. You might be looking at 115, 120, um, maybe more if you opted for the custom color paint or the, you know, whatever other options are out there. But for that $120,000 car, 10 or 11 or 12 or 13 years later to be valued in half, that's not terrible for the next buyer. You can find them pretty easily with under 50,000 miles. Um, some of the older, the 08s, the 09s, and even the 10s, you know, once they hit 50, 60, 70, maybe 80,000 miles, they have really bottomed out. Um, the ones that I've mentioned before that are below 60,000, the two that have salvage titles, I want to say have 20 and 25,000 miles on them. Pretty low. The other one that doesn't have a salvage title has 85,000 miles. Um, I've yet to see too many with north of 100,000 miles. Most of these cars are, are driven um, to maybe that point. And then I don't know if they're garaged or they've just been wrecked or I have no idea. But very seldom have I seen one for sale with that many miles. And that surprises me a little bit because, again, these are 12 and 13 year old cars. So, you know, all things being equal, if, if I were to buy one of these back in 2008, would I have daily driven it? I don't know. I was daily driving an Audi at that point, and that car was really engineered. This car, the R8, was really engineered to be a daily driver. Now, one caveat with that car um, is that it, it's very often considered the poor man's Lamborghini Gallardo. Now, the Gallardo shares the platform. It's the same chassis, the same suspension, the same everything for the most part. Um, a few years after the Audi R8 came out, Audi opted to release the car with a V10. So instead of the 4.2 liter V8, they came out with a 5.2 liter V10. Now that V10 is what was found in the Lamborghini equivalent. So once the V10 came out, they offered it with a gated six speed manual or the, the push button automatic. Um, the Lamborghini had the same, same two options. And the Lambo was, uh, MSRP wise, don't quote me, but I want to say seventy or eighty thousand dollars more base price. Or we're talking almost two hundred grand for that Lamborghini. So is it worth that much more? That's for you to decide. I'd say no. Um, my understanding is the fit and finish on the Audi is just as nice, if not better, especially towards the end of the production of that Gallardo. Once two thousand twelve rolled around. Audi did do a little bit of a facelift. Uh, they modified the headlights, the grill, the front and back balances are a little different. A few tweaks to the insides, um, but beyond that, not a lot of change. You know, to this normal human, we're not gonna notice those differences unless we're really, really looking. Um, when 2015 rolled around, they came out with a brand new car. Now again, from 20, 30, 40, 50 feet away, you wouldn't necessarily see every de detail difference. But it had more of a chiseled jaw, so to speak. It, it had a little bit more of a defined edge on the front bumper, back bumper. The headlights were a little more squared off, a um, little more angry looking. And I think that that was actually well-deserved. I think that this car had really proven itself to the masses and people were really taking it seriously as not just a sports car, but a true exotic. Um, you, you were able to drive a car that was a Lamborghini equivalent that you could take down to your local Audi dealer and have oil changes and services done on. Very, very convenient for an entry-level supercar. The 2015 through the 2021 model now, right, 
they're still producing in low numbers. Um, my family and I were down in Southern California a few months ago and driving down the highway, I did see one in bright yellow. I think that's the only reason it caught my eye was because it was bright yellow. And it got me wondering how, how many of those cars are out there? So again, pulling up the sales figures in 20, let's see, 2017, 2017 is as late as this goes for US sales figures, 772 cars. But I can tell you worldwide in 2018, only 1,700 cars were produced. And in 2019, only 2,100 cars produced. So a majority of those cars do tend to stay in Europe. I would suggest that that number, if you trip, uh, I'm sorry, if you divided it by three, that might be what came to the States. Um, you know, again, in 2008, 56, almost 5,700 cars were produced and only 900 made it here. So never has there been a year other than 2011, we've hit north of a thousand cars imported. So the 18s, 19s, and 20s aren't gonna be any different. Uh, total, up until 2017, this is old numbers, only 8,136 Audi R8s are on our roads. So again, a very exclusive car, you're not gonna see one every day. Major cities maybe have a few, the suburbs maybe a few more, but they're not a real common car. There's one in my town here. It is a gated V10 car. It's awesome. It's black. I see it every day. I love it. And it, it, it's kind of what inspired this video. Um, it, again, it's been, it's been one of those cars that I've really lusted after for more than a decade. And they have finally plateaued downwards enough that I could see myself getting one at some point. So I don't know how soon that would be. And I mean, by all means, I'll do a walk around in the whole nine and, and you'll get to know it. But I don't know when and if I'll ever have one. It's just one of those things that's always been a pipe dream and I've always kind of worked towards that. And now they're within grasp. I think that someday soon you might see one. So if we transition away from the Audi R8, I would, I would say there's a few basic competitors. Um, but the one that strikes a chord with me is another car that I've kind of lusted after since it came out. And I would classify myself as kind of a car freak. I stay up to date on what I need to know and what I, I know what I like and I know what I don't and I pay attention to certain things and then disregard others. And I haven't really spent a lot of time investigating the electric car segment. And so this car, this car came out, um, I'm going to botch this. It came out in 2014, but I want to say, and I'm going to tell you here, the production car did come out in 14, but the concept car was actually released in 2011. And it was unlike anything else out there at the time. It, it really turned heads. It was at all sorts of auto shows. And then in 2012, they came out with the Spider version. And the Spider version is just the convertible or the roofless edition. Um, the car that I'm talking about here is the BMW i8. Now, it is considered a plug-in electric car. So before with the Audi, we were talking about you know, V8 power, V10 power. Now we're transitioning to electric car. So when you look at this car, it looks like it's straight out of a sci-fi movie. It is very unique. It is very eye-catching. Um, when my family and I were down in Southern California, we saw two, maybe three. We may have seen the same one twice because it was white. Um, we also saw a silver one, but we saw two or three i8s, and they really turned my head. I mean, the bright yellow Audi R8 was one thing, but the i8, um, it was on another level, I felt like, just from seeing it in, in the flesh. Um, it definitely stands out, and it is a head turn. So it's a little bit different. Again, it's not going to have... Uh, the exhaust note that a V10 is gonna carry. It's, it's gonna actually drive down the road really quietly. Uh, it's a little different in that it has butterfly doors or Lambo doors, if you will, right? It's got the scissor doors that go up. And um, an Audi R8 is really boring. It's got your standard, just open the car door type of doors. Um, you know, so again, another exotic change from, from one to the other. Um, you know, the i8 does have a small, I suppose it's a two liter, or I'll actually tell you here, it's a small little three cylinder um, gas engine, right? It, it's got, or, I'm sorry, it's a 1.5 liter three cylinder turbo diesel engine. Um, 
and that is actually not correct. That was what they had initially wanted to put in the car. Forgive me, I'm reading this off of uh, one of these BMW website here. And that was in the early concept car is what they put that uh, turbo diesel engine. By the time the actual production model came out, it also carried, let's see, it had, I'm not even seeing it. Strange. Okay, well, while I'm kind of glancing for this, right, it does have a pure battery pack capability of driving up to 20 miles and on pure electric. So if it's parked right here in my garage and I have it plugged in, I can unplug it, push the go button, and drive myself to work and back and you know drive around town up to 20-ish miles, uh, depending on speed and other conditions, but never having to turn the engine on. Now, if it's running with gas, uh, it does average what this thing says, city driving 35 miles a gallon, um, which, which seems pretty reasonable uh, for, for a sports car of this caliber, right? It doesn't have super efficient tires on it. It's not going to um, really be designed for gas mileage. And that's not the design of this car. This car is a very cool, futuristic looking sports car, uh, you know, exotic if you will, but it does have that eco-friendly aspect. Uh, this car was also produced in very, very limited quantities. So this thing has, I'm going to scroll down here and tell you the production numbers in the U.S. Um, first year in 2014, only 555 of these cars came over. 2015 was the largest year, 2,265. By 16, they had less than 1,600. By 17, less than 500. By 2018, only 770. And by 2019, it did exceed 1,000. It was back up to 1,100, but that was the final production year. And BMW did tell us in 2019 that they were going to terminate production. And I think what ended up happening is so many people realized, now's my chance to buy one. Um, or it's going to be a collectible down the line, so I better buy one while they're still producing them. I want to be a one-owner car. I want to keep miles off of it, whatever. And so I think production picked up in 2019 and then they cut, cut the cord. And, um, you know, there have been rumors that it might be back in 2022. It might not be the, the I-8, it might be something different. Um, but, you know, long story short, this car, if you were to buy one, you know, today, uh, you, you can also find one in the $60,000 range. Um, many of them, much like the R8, have been wrecked. So they've got reconstructed or theft recovery or, you know, uh, whatever else, types of title brands. And, and so to find a, a clean title without any markings, uh, a low miles example of one of these is going to cost you north of $60,000. When it came out in 2014, it had a sticker price, a base MSRP of $136,000. And again, you could spec that way up and have a $150,000 or $60,000 car. By its final production year in 2019, it did have an MSRP of $148,000. So, you know, if you can find a, a high spec car that had a big sticker tag, and something with low miles, you know, two or three or four or five years later, you can get yourself one heck of a car for not a lot of money. It's still a lot of money, but compared to what it would have cost to drive it off that showroom floor, you're doing okay. So, you know, let's, let's compare those two, you know, as far as putting them in a drag race straight down, the electric car is gonna have that instantaneous torque. It, it's not gonna be the same in a gas motor. But you're going to have that beautiful sound, you're going to have the beautiful rumble and the feel and everything in the gas car as opposed to the electric. The electric's just going to be like sitting in your recliner and accelerating forward. It's going to put you back, probably pretty hard, but you're not going to have that same sensation as the, the rumbling sound of that, you know, V8 or V10 six inches behind your head. You know, that, that rear mid-engine sports car to the electric car. There's not a comparison probably further apart. Um, <laughs> I mean, they're, they're totally different animals. The, the BMW has four seats, the Audi has two. 
Now, granted, those four seats, the backs are about the size of my iPad. Um, you'd have to have a very small child sitting back there or a very tiny adult with the front seats way up. Uh, it wouldn't be a comfortable ride. So for me, I'm six, two and a half ish. Uh, for me, I'd probably want the driver's seat a good ways back. I don't know if anybody would be able to sit behind me. Um, you know, if we're looking at rarity, um, there's not an i8 in my town that I'm aware of. There, there may be, uh, but I've never seen one. I know of at least one R8. I have seen a couple others passing through town. I've seen them here and there, car shows and things. So they're, they're out there, but the i8s are still, I mean, very, very uncommon. And worldwide production, I'm sorry, not worldwide, but US production from the start of 2014 through the very last car of 2019 was only 6,700. So, you know, in a five year, six year span, 6,700 cars, there, there's again, just not a lot of them out there. So, you know, if you're looking for something that's really eye catching, I think either car is going to do it. I think that a majority of those R8s tend to be black, silver, gray, or white. And, and those aren't as eye-catching as that bright yellow one that I saw. The i8, kind of the same story. Black, silver, gray, and white are the most common. They did have a really beautiful blue color. They also had a, I call it a highlighter green color, yellowish green. Um, I've seen that several times. And I, at first, the first time I saw it, I thought it was a custom wrap. And um, no, that was, <laughs> it was an actual option and uh, not a good one. But if you can get one of those colors, even if you don't love it, I think long term from a resale perspective, it's a really good approach because there aren't very many of these cars to begin with. So if you have a rare color or a car with really rare options, you've got something desirable. Transitioning back to the Audi, I would suggest that those gated six speed, especially the V10 cars, those are the ones that are just going up in value. They have, they've probably never hit that $60,000 mark. They probably got real close and then turned and went up. And I think as the future of automotive technologies advance, you know, a lot of cars have done away with manual gearboxes altogether. Other companies have gone away with internal combustion engines altogether, right? So finding one that's both, especially a V10, to me, that's super desirable. And if I had it my way, I would probably get the right color. And I don't know what that is yet, right? <laughs> but I would probably go after a red or a blue, maybe a white, I love the white ones too, but a V10 manual uh, R8. And then on, on the BMW side, you know, I think that's a more practical get around town car being that it is a plug-in electric. You're gonna turn heads when you get to the grocery store and you pop that door up and it, you know, and it, it Lambo scissors up. Um, people are going to look, right? You're going to get the attention that you want from a supercar, but you're going to do it in such a way that they're not even going to hear you coming. And I don't know that I love that. Again, I think it's a very cool car and I wouldn't mind having one. I think that's very practical for what it is. But if I were to choose, I would lean towards the R8 because it's a true sports car. I think that the future of sports cars may be electric. You've got that instant torque. You've got good top end speed. If they can figure out how to make batteries hold longer charges, maybe in a smaller package so that they don't weigh as much. You know, EV vehicles have a long way to go, but they're here to stay. And I, I think that this is a great entry level way in um, because the next EV competitor in a supercar is probably Porsche, Ferrari, or, or Lamborghini if, if, the, if and when they come out with one. And, you know, the Porsches are hundreds of thousands of dollars. Ferraris are too. Tesla, you know, Tesla's EVs are great cars. I mean, from a reliability standpoint, from a comfort standpoint, you know, bells and whistles, yes, for the most part, you're going to hear a lot of positives about Tesla. I haven't heard too much negative. I mean, I think that the negatives that I have heard are primarily from people that either don't understand them or just don't like the idea of an EV. So I think that there's some unfair bias against Tesla. I've never driven one, so I can't give it, you know, a, it's an amazing car or no, it's the worst. I'm not gonna do that. But from a competitive standpoint to the i8, the Tesla Roadster might be a pretty close competitor. Um, 
but I don't know. Again, I have never driven one, so I can't say for sure. Uh, the new Roadster that's coming out is by all means going to be a supercar. Uh, I mean, from, from a numbers perspective, there's not going to be a lot that can touch it. It's going to be incredibly fast off the line. It's going to have really high top speed. Um, it's small and nimble and, you know, all those things. And you don't have to worry about oil changes. You don't have to worry about any of that maintenance. So that's pretty amazing in an electric car. So I guess the point of this whole thing was to just share with you guys two cars that someday I would love to own. A little bit about each, why I like each, and then kind of pose the question to you. If, if you had sixty dollars or $70,000 in your pocket and each of these cars sitting in front of you, which way would you go? So comment down below and let me know. I'd also love to get some feedback from you guys about what you'd like to hear in future videos. Like always, please like and subscribe. And, and again, may every investment you make be a good one. Till next time.